Well, hey there guys. Greetings once again from hot and sunny Cambodia. In this episode, we are no longer in Phnom Penh. We are no longer in Sihanoukville. We are in a very well-known city because of its magnificent old temple. Truly uh, one of the wonders of the world called Angkor Wat that many of you have heard of. That's right, we're in the city of Siem Reap. And apparently this city has about 250,000 residents, which I honestly thought it would have had more. But we're out here doing a little bit of exploration and these sites look familiar to me because I'll, I'll tell you, this is my first time here ever. And the reason this looks familiar is because of a channel that I follow, a guy named Saved in Svai, a British guy who does really good videos out of Cambodia. So check him out if you're interested. He did a piece coming out here and was showing CM Reap. So a lot of this looks familiar, but of course it's different when you're physically here. But we're right here on the CM Reap River. Got a couple of guys, a couple of buddies drinking some beers. Susa day. Got a gentleman fishing over here. What is that, a little frog for bait? When he cast that out, something felt like a little piece of that frog flew over and hit me in the hand. <laughs> But uh, this river, the Siem Reap River, flows right into the Tonle Sap Lake, which then turns into a river and flows and eventually connects with the Mekong. This originally was just a little offshoot, but it has evolved into an actual river. First impressions. Well, it's damn hot here, but that's okay. Some people can't handle the heat though. And uh, if that's you, then you probably don't wanna come during the hot season but it's definitely hot. It's about 38, 39 degrees Celsius, uh, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But you can go for a nice peaceful walk right here along the river. You can see there aren't really that many people. I'm not seeing any tourists here along the river. Of course, come nighttime, things could change a little bit, but this is just like kind of almost like a park, you know? Just a nice little walkway along the river. But if you go forward, that's where things start getting a little bit crazy because that area is known as Pub Street. And it pretty much lives up to the name. There's a lot of pubs, a lot of restaurants. You can get Khmer food, you can get Western food, and both of them will be authentic because of the huge expat community and all the tourists coming through here. They're going to be able to make Western food that's actually legit and good. And of course, because we're in Cambodia, the Khmer food is gonna be legit. So for food, it's pretty good. And I was looking at the prices, especially for the Khmer food, at least the places I went to were very, very reasonable. Now, like Saved and Spy was saying in his video, this city and in particular, this area is not gonna be the true authentic Cambodia because this caters to tourism. I mean, you'll definitely get plenty of you know Cambodian culture and all that here and you'll see plenty of Cambodian people but you know this area is really catering to foreigners and tourists but it's very popular amongst tourists from around the world so I think there's probably something for everybody out here you know of course if you want to see more of a true authentic Cambodian reality then there are plenty of other places to go that wouldn't be too far from here and you can see they've got a lot going on over here. I don't know if you can, you guys can guess why, but I'm gonna tell you. Give you three seconds to guess. Three, two, one. No, you got it wrong. Susadai. Happy New Year. That's why they're setting this up for the Cambodia New Year, right? They're gonna have some music up here, probably a concert. And this is Pub Street. This is Siem Reap's Pub Street. It's well known. If you come to this city, you will end up being here. I booked my hotel. I didn't even try to end up in this area, but when I arrived, when I got off the bus, a driver picked me up and he drove me out here. And just by coincidence, uh, this is where I ended up. So if you book a hotel here in Siem Reap, if you use like booking.com or something, there's a high chance that the place you're looking at is gonna be here right around Pub Street. Just like if you use a similar website to book a place in Phnom Penh, it's probably gonna put you riverside, just like you could see in my uh, Phnom Penh video. Well, let's check out this little pub street alley. See what's going on over here. Now, yeah, that's a smart kid. It's a good day for a water gun fight. I'll tell you that right now. Everything you see, restaurants, 
hostels, bars, literally everything around here is catering to tourism. Here we are at All Cheers Street. That little alley that I just cut through, that led me from Pub Street over here to All Cheers Street, which I think uh, that's just basically the same thing as Pub Street. Well, there's something new, Crocodile Pizza, Crocodile Burger. I've actually had alligator and uh, tastes like chicken. Pub Street. It's always happy hour here on Pub Street. I'll tell you, the uh, tourism industry is just booming here. Cambodia, Thailand, it's really, Vietnam, it's really just booming out here. And you know, living in China, it's interesting because I can see that the exact opposite has happened in China. Like there used to be areas where you'd see that looked like this, tons of international tourists, people from all over the globe. And uh, you just don't see that. I mean, you'll see Westerners sometimes and non-Chinese people, but it's nothing like, like this. Those days are gone. It's a shame, you know, because China's got a lot of beautiful places and it's just changed so much over the years, people just don't want to go. You know, some travelers aren't really that adventurous when it comes to food. So just know that if you come to Siem Reap, there are plenty of Westerner friendly options. I mean, we've got the whole Italian menu right here and some good steaks. And this isn't the only place that has a menu like this. You've got so many options over here. I mean, you really do. For all international travelers, you'd be in food heaven over here. Shot with the police over here. <laughs> We've got a lot of these things over here. Stick your feet in. Just let the fish eat the dead skin off your feet. These are bigger than what I've usually seen. God, they could probably take off half a toe. Usually they're really small fish. That's not something I'm really interested in though. It's festive all around, even when you look up. 360 degree festivities. I picked a place to eat, and the reason I'm coming here to eat Khmer food is because, well, first of all, the uh, there are, are a lot of people here eating, so that's always a good sign. I won't go somewhere if there's no customers. And also the waitress was really, really nice too. Now I will say I was just out there walking on the street, and one of these tuk-tuk driver guys walked up to me and uh, he asked me if I wanted a tuk-tuk. I said, oh no, thank you. And then he asked me if I would like some, how can I word this? Let's just say that mean green, you know what I'm talking about. And I said, no, thanks. So it turns out I was talking to a lady who has a shop down there and I found out about these uh, police officers here who wear the brown uniforms, which I told her was different than where I'm from. They, they wear blue. These are the guys that like public order police or something like that. So they're navigating this street to make sure people aren't violating any you know rules. Like I, I, they just told these people they need to move their sign in. So they're just out here. Uh, <laughs> there he is. They're just out here keeping an eye on things and making sure that people are uh, following the rules. Cambodia has their own beer, several different brands, and this is one that I had not heard of until just now. And you can see the advertisements hanging above the street. Crud, or crud. In English, if you say crud, that's it. <laughs> but this is one of the Cambodian beers that I haven't tried yet. A couple things I like about this beer. I, I like the name, crud. I actually like that. And, uh, it's actually a decent quality beer. It's actually not that bad. And here's another thing. Hey, it came out ice cold. And guess what this long neck costs? One dollar. That's right, let me repeat that. One dollar. Those police have been on these business owner and you know street vendor owners' asses. I've seen them approach quite a few and tell them to move this or move that. And I've seen them do these kind of group photos at both ends of the street now. It's kind of funny. All right, dinner is served. One of Cambodia's most famous dishes, fish amok. Well, at night, we're over here, Riverside. It's the Riverside Night Market. They're cooking up some goods over here. The street vendors are out in full effect, and it's still early. It's just starting to, just getting started. It's not even dark yet. They're grilling up all kinds of stuff. Chicken, sausage. Hello. Looks very delicious. Yeah, would you like barbecue? Maybe later. Just based on the, uh, happy new year. Just based on the sheer number of chairs they've got out here, you can tell it's, uh, they're expecting a big crowd. Hello. Hello. Salsa die. 
Hello. Yeah, the, the night is young, as you can see. It's not even dark yet. This is interesting. Look at the way he's just grilling these fish. Just barbecuing them over these hot coals. Wow, I can feel it. Are these from this river? No. No. Where are they from? Oh, Tonle Sap. Oh, yes, yes. See what these little dogs are up to. He's checking me out. Little street side pet shop here. Birds. Hamsters, bunnies. Cute little dogs. Oh, it's so hard for me to walk away. Look at that. Oh, you're breaking my heart over here, guys. Oh, I got... I can't handle this. This is too much. Bye, buddies. Well, things are starting to get a little bit uh, busy out here. The sun's going down, and it feels so much better out here. It's actually bearable. All right, guys, it's official. I'm lost in Cambodia. I was trying to get back to my hotel. Took probably about five wrong turns, and uh, here I am. <laughs> I'll get back one of these days, but I don't know when. Well, if you get hungry, you can always swing by the uh, Second White restaurant. There's a really nice dog. Hey, give me a kiss. Yeah, that's a good dog. Soft. There's a clean one here. Hey. Oh. You're sweet. Now, have I got some laundry done today? And I've got to say, I just ran into one lady who was not particularly pleasant. I don't know where I put that ticket. It may have fallen out of my pocket or whatnot, but I already paid it. And she was saying, where's your ticket? Where's your ticket? I said, I'm looking for it. I don't know. And then she just, she had a real nasty look on her face. And I said, you know what? You can call. I know you've got the young guy who was working here's phone number. Just make a quick phone call. She was almost trying to act like she wasn't going to give me my clothes back. And that's just, I understand it's my responsibility not to lose the receipt, but there's other ways to, uh, in a shop that small, there's other ways to verify that it's been paid. And she, she looked, she saw the ticket, but uh, yeah, she was kind of a, she was kind of a, a feisty one. Wow, I'll tell you what, this traffic is insane. Just trying to cross this one little street is extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. Hey guys, day two in hot, sunny Siem Reap, Cambodia. I want you all to see, uh, this is a Cambodian primary school. And it looks pretty interesting. Interesting colors, interesting style. All right, well, I've been in Cambodia for like five days now. I think today's the fifth day, if I'm not mistaken. It's, I feel like I've been here like two or three weeks already because I've been squeezing so much in every day, covering so much ground. This is the first meal that I've had here that has not been Khmer food. I just wanted a change of pace, just a little break from it. I like it, but I just wanted, I don't know, just craving something different. This little croissant ham and cheese sandwich was like, I think a, a dollar fifty. This little baby omelet was like a dollar fifty. <laughs> the orange juice costs as much as both of these together, but the orange juice is fantastic. So. A good full breakfast to give me the energy I need to get through the day because we got a lot of exploring to do. This little restaurant's actually right by my hostel. The young ladies, the waitresses, they met. I met them yesterday and uh, they, they took care of me over here and uh, gave great service and were super friendly and sweet. So I decided to come back again today. Okay, I decided to rent a motorbike, speed things up and just give myself that freedom, you know, just hop on and go anywhere I want. I mean, the price, you can't beat the price. 10 bucks for a day we got to fuel up a little bit for the day there was there was gas in there but there's only one liter now you can't just go directly to anchor Wat. first you've got to go to a completely separate location to buy the tickets and that's where i just arrived but you can see there's a lot of buildings here so I just have to find the right spot. 
Well, based on the looks of things, I would say that's probably it. There's something around here. Because it looks kind of kind of fancy over here. There it is, Anchor Tourism Information Office. Okay, so this is definitely it. Anchor Tourism Information Office. The Anchor Visitor Code of Conduct. Let's see what the rules are so I don't break any rules. Okay. Monks are revered and respected. If you want to take pictures, ask for permission. Uh, women should not touch or stand or sit too close to the monks. Don't touch the carvings, blah, blah, blah. Don't wear revealing clothes. Do not climb on loose stones. Keep the sound to a minimum. Don't give things to beggars. It's no smoke. That's basically it. That's, that's me paraphrasing it for you. Okay, and we just walk in here to get a ticket. It's a really nice place. It's clean. Tile floors. And if you look at these, they've got... It was confusing me because they've got these different, like, Bafuan Temple, Bayan Temple, Angkor Wat Temple. I didn't know which window to go to, but I need the one-day pass. So, I've been directed to go over here to window number 34. Sauce today. Okay, $37 later. Got my ticket. Okay, we're back here in the parking area. It's definitely a place you need to come with wheels because uh, from the entrance point until here, by foot, it'll probably take like an hour. So you need a bike or a tuk-tuk or something like that. Now they know how to ice a drink over here. That's Look at that, that's a whole block. It's so hot out here, you guys can't even imagine. Like every day, like over 100 degrees. Cambodia has the, the, the dry season and the wet season. It's basically hot all year round, but if you're gonna ice drink, this is the way to do it. Hey, so should I. Well guys, we made it. I haven't even really gotten in here yet and I'm already blown away. As we walk through here, I'm not gonna give you, I'm not gonna be a guide. I'm not gonna give you a historical documentary type of video. I'm simply going to show you the sites and share some of my notes and uh, hopefully you find it interesting. So I guess a good starting point is what is this place? Well, this was the capital. Anchor was the capital of the Khmer Empire. And at its peak, this entire, you know, ancient capital would have been, this entire capital would have been about the size of London. In terms of size and at its peak, they would have had up to possibly a million people living in Anchor. Now this place was built in the style and tradition of Hindu cosmology. And to build this place took about 30 years and required about 300,000 workers. Let that sink in. Back in the 12th century roundabout, King Sayavarman declared himself the king of kings and a living god and the ruler of the Khmer Empire and he instructed this place to be built. An anchor was to remain the capital of the Khmer Empire for 600 years. Now Angkor Wat itself, it was just one part of Angkor, but it was a major part. This was the official state temple. And until today, it stands as the largest religious monument in the world. The, the Khmer Empire is one that we don't often hear talked about, but in the history books, when it's all said and done, it was quite an empire to behold. And like I said, this site that we're on would have been the capital for 600 years. So from the, from the line of the original ruler here, there were 38 successive rulers all connected to him via bloodline they called this their capital you see the size of these stones well keep in mind they were having to have these transported via elephant and then the workers doing all the work just you know through physical labor intense labor 
And another really interesting thing I learned about this place is that the precision which with they set these stones without modern technology, it was so precise that even nowadays with the technology we have, it would be very hard to match. And they did this almost a thousand years ago. Wow, this is truly impressive. I mean, I know this place is a tourist trap, but it is one of the wonders of the world. And I can totally see why. After the Khmer Empire fell in the 15th century, this place just started to, it was just left to itself. And keep in mind, this was constructed in a jungle. You know, nature is very bad for the preservation of things like this. And this climate here in this region in Cambodia, being in a jungle, there's monsoon seasons. So this place just went into disrepair pretty quick and it sat that way and just fell apart for about 400 years. You know, in the 1860s, Cambodia became a French protectorate. And just before that happened, there was a French explorer that was out here. And people, a lot of people say that he discovered this, but he didn't discover it. He sort of rediscovered it, but there were Khmer villages sitting right next to this, but they didn't know the full story. And, and of course they probably had their superstitions about it. They thought this had just always been here. You know, really kind of simplistic beliefs. But it was that French explorer that came and kind of rediscovered this place. And he wrote about it and his book really exploded over in Europe. And thus started the rediscovery of Angkor Wat. The excavations, the rebuilding, because a lot of this was just stones laying on the ground. And since then, it's become a World Heritage Site, so there are a lot of different nations working together to, uh, to help fund the repair of this amazing place. You know, the crazy thing about it is life works in the funniest of ways. The French explorer that uh, stumbled upon this in the 1860s, well, he died about a year later. Uh, the reason for his death actually occurred not too far from here. It was in the jungles of present-day Laos. And uh, he died from malarial fever. Now, this place initially was a lot more than just stone structures. The thing is, a lot of the other structures no longer exist. And the reason for this is, you know, these shrines and temples, these were built... These were built for the gods, so they wanted it to be very strong, solid structure, and last. And thus, they still remain. I don't do great with heights. I kind of, kind of like them, but I do get a little queasy. But I sort of like that feeling. But uh, walking up here, you just think about the step in front of you. You don't look back. It's quite an interesting way to phrase that possibility of visit. It's telling you these are the ways you can go. You can see there were some traditional Khmer. Arkun, on. It looks very beautiful. Very beautiful. Okay, this is the same sign. The Chinese is exactly the same. It looks like they had a different translator working on that day. I would say way of visit works a lot better than possibility of visit. Again, not necessarily for the faint of heart. Excavations and repairs of Angkor Wat and the entire uh, Angkor Temple complex have been going on since the later end of the 19th century. But they did come to a halt in the mid to late 1970s. I'm guessing you can probably figure out why. During Pol Pot's reign of terror, they did have to take four years off from their repair efforts here. You know, speaking of Pol Pot, since he wanted a Chinese-style communist revolution here in Cambodia, you know, like in China, they destroyed a lot of their historical places and temples, and just a lot of the traditional culture was absolutely destroyed. Now, you know what? It's just really lucky that Pol Pot didn't make it one of his projects to make this place disappear and turn it to rubble. Thank goodness he didn't, you know, because... I'm actually surprised he didn't, but uh, lucky for us, he didn't. 
But one thing that Pol Pot did do is he did place landmines all around this place to keep people away from it. I know that they paid painstaking attention to detail in this place, but I also noticed a couple of other details. They certainly went to great lengths. If I didn't have electronic devices on me, I would jump right into those sprinklers. Gosh, that would feel so good. I might have to find a swimming pool today because <laughs> it's just too damn hot. Now I told you guys, one thing I love when I'm out here traveling in Southeast Asia is the fact that you can get fresh coconut. Chilled, refrigerated, and just drink it straight out. I, I just love it. You know, you stop and chill for a minute, you want something to drink. You know, you can get some of these sweetened drinks, you could get a, a sports drink, you could just get a water, but drinking this, there's nothing bad for your health. It's, it's good for you and it tastes delicious, it's super refreshing. $2 a pop here. So why did the Khmer ruler want to build this amazing city and capital of his empire in the jungle? I mean, that's a very, it's one of the most inhospitable type of places to, to build something like this. Well, one of the reasons is, is because we are just north of the Tonle Sap Lake, which was a huge water source. And that brings me to the main point of how they made this happen. How were they able to survive and thrive here? One of the biggest reasons they were able to do that was because of their ability to manage water. Reservoirs and canals and the ability to use hydraulic pressure to send the water to where they needed it to go, mainly to keep the rice paddies with plenty of water. So their methods of water management, setting up reservoirs and irrigating the fields, the rice paddies, is what allowed them to really survive here. That said, it wouldn't take a whole lot to wreak havoc on their empire because if there was any kind of natural disaster or just any series of events that, uh, that messed up their water supply, that would mean no water and no rice, and that would mean that they were just in a really, really bad place. When you leave, you walk on the floating bridge. All right, we're actually not at Angkor Wat right now. We're really close. We're still within the uh, Khmer Empire, the Angkor Empire, but this is called Angkor Tom. And Angkor Wat was the, the official area for their temples and it was the main religious zone. Now this was more so the capital of the Angkor Empire. This place was actually written about in the journal of a Chinese official who came over here to the Khmer Empire in, I think it was 1296. His name was Zhou Daguan. And he wrote about this. He wrote about Angkor Thom. He wrote about this place and talked about how magnificent it was and said it was just teeming with life. And of course, also in his journals, you know, he said things that were quite prejudiced against the Khmer you know, referring to them as barbarians and stuff. But keep in mind, to the Chinese back then, anybody that wasn't Chinese was, in their eyes, a barbarian. So, but he wrote about this place. So people had read about it, but it hadn't been found or excavated yet. Well, it turns out that his writings were true. And they have found it. They've been working on setting it back up how it used to be. And here it is today. This was the capital the actual capital of the Khmer Empire. This is just about three kilometers from Angkor Wat. You see this entire temple complex here at Angkor, just, it was ruins and most of what you see here had fallen and just, it was just stone slabs on the ground like this. And you've got these professionals, professionals from various countries and the World Heritage Organization coming here 
to set it back up. So it's it's a it's just constantly a work in progress. They're just setting it back up how it used to be. And it's amazing because you can just walk right through it. A thousand year old Khmer capital. <laughs> Can see the intricacy on all these blocks and that's right do not touch the carvings please if you come here please don't be one of those people you can see all those stone slabs laying on the ground rebuild it <laughs> gotta say this is one of the coolest bridges I've ever crossed A thousand years old this whole ancient city is massive okay so you're just riding around and you'll see Here's just another temple standing here. There's nobody here visiting it. Looks like they're working on some pretty serious excavations, stacking it back up. And according to Zhou Daguan's visit to the uh, Khmer Empire all those years ago, he said that the ruler had five wives and about 3,000 concubines. Well, I'm about to be done here, I did, but I did want to finish it up by talking about the, the downfall of the Khmer Empire and the amazing city of Angkor. Initially, this was a Hindu city, and it transitioned to Buddhism, I, I believe around the 13th century. And when it transitioned to Buddhism, the people no longer viewed their rulers as gods. So that could have had a negative impact on their willingness to really give their absolute everything to upkeep the place and maintain the city. Also another really important thing that I learned was that not that long ago there were some archaeologists and they cut down a tree and were looking at the rings within the tree because in doing that they can learn a lot about rainfall over the years and droughts. They can see all that through the tree rings. Well, just around the time when the Khmer Empire collapsed, there was a really, really bad drought. So there's a high likelihood that one reason this whole thing fell apart, and it fell apart fairly quickly, and it's still somewhat of a mystery. Nobody really knows why. But if their water supply had problems, and there was a big drought, and they couldn't maintain their rice cultivation, well, things would have gone downhill really, really quickly from there. So you're just cruising down the road and see them reap and you come across things like this. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. And you can see those girls there are soaking wet and they've got baby powder on them. That's because the New Year celebration is here. That's what they do. When the Cambodian New Year comes, it's the same in Thailand. They will put baby powder on you and splash water on you. So for me, I've gotta be careful because that could be bad for my electronic devices. I've already had a few people shoot me with water guns. <laughs> And it's still early. It's only going to get worse from here. So uh, this rental bike, I'm probably going to just return it early and be done with it because uh, being out tonight, it's going to be wet and powdery and I'm not really up for that. See, there's... You got to be careful. Shit! All right, guys, I think you can see why it's time for me to put away the camera because uh, water and cameras don't mix very well usually. All right, guys, we are in the Tuk Tuk and we are leaving Siam Reap. I've had a good time here, I'm not gonna lie. I've enjoyed the, the city. It's very, very tourist friendly. I've also met some really nice, lovely local Khmer people. Went to Angkor Wat. And uh, just been overall a good experience. So final thoughts. This, like I said, it's a very tourist friendly city. You are gonna be able to find food that you like no matter what. Uh, you're gonna meet people from all over the world. Prices are reasonable. I didn't really have anybody try to cheat me. I mean, they'll try to get more money out of you than other locals, but you just bargain a little bit. 
So yeah, if you come to Cambodia, you, you definitely have to uh, check out Siem Reap. And you will naturally anyway, because if you come to Cambodia, chances are you're gonna visit Angkor Wat, and this is the place, this is where it is, so. Guys, I hope you all have enjoyed this video and this uh, somewhat in-depth tour of the city. I've certainly enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to hit that like button. Also, if you'd like to follow my future adventures, please make sure to subscribe to the channel to keep up to date, because let me tell you, I've got a lot of videos on the way. I've got really big plans for this year. And to everyone who's been supporting me, I just want to say thanks again. You guys' support really means the world to me, and I don't say that lightly. So that's going to end this video for now. We'll catch you in the next video, in the next destination.